Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to the show. Do 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 ba da da do 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 da da da. Woo, woo. We are back on the show. It's called Divine Dingo, and I'm your host. My name is Ashley, and you have to say it like that whenever you greet me. If you say it any other way, um, I'll slap you in the face, and I I mean that. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for being here to find Dingo. My name is, you know what my name is. So I don't have to say it again. Plus, you know, if I don't say it that way, I have to slap myself in the face. So, you know, I'm just not feeling that today. I am currently in Arizona. I don't think that I'm in a town because I'm staying at a Buddhist retreat center that's literally like right off of the highway. But I'm in between Flagstaff and Williams, Arizona. And uh, I don't know. I drove through Williams, Arizona today. And it's, I guess, right on the famous Route 66, which I guess is cool. Also, do you say route or route? Leave your answer in the comments below in the comment section that does not exist on your podcast app. Thank you. So, yeah, I'm here sitting in my room, which I'll be here for, I guess, about a week now. I got here yesterday. Um, And if you heard that ding, it is my roommate's cell phone just dinging away over there. Probably a ding of uh, confirmation, if I'm honest. So don't remember what I was saying three seconds ago, but I'm sure that I am on the path I need to be on because of the ding. So anyways, in Arizona, I've been traveling. I have been, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I have two podcasts. I have, I have this podcast recorded, ready to go. And then I have another one with Tierra that I'm going to put out um, sometime in the future. I have been kind of bouncing around. I mean, I was at a um, an animal sanctuary for two weeks and, you know, there was Wi-Fi and there just wasn't like a lot of it was not a great place to sit down and like record because it was 20 dogs. And at any given moment, they might all decide to howl at the moon, which they did do multiple times, many, any hour of the day or night. And yeah, I may have joined in because um, when you're sitting in the middle of a house with 20 dogs, they're all howling at once. Why wouldn't you join in with that? I mean, are, w- w- it's a once in a lifetime opportunity or so I thought the first time that it happened and then it happened like several times after that. And then, you know, I was like, okay, well, this is a several moment. <laughs> Anyways, I don't know what I just said. I'm having a day, but that's all right. We're all having days. So what have I said so far? Buddhist retreat center, Northern Arizona. I'm going to go to the Grand Canyon sometime this week, you know, and th- I'm going to do that all American trip. But I'm going to spice it up by hiking down into the Grand Canyon. So, you know, <laughs> like the the mule that I am or that I have been. The old donkey. The old divine donkey, you know what I mean? So today on the podcast, let's get down to business, shall we? Um, today on the podcast, I have my new friend, Mata Shalanika, who I met in when I was doing a work trade um, through a website called WorkAway. If you guys are interested at all in traveling and don't want to pay for a campsite or a hotel or an Airbnb every town you go to, hit me up. I'll tell you all my experiences about using WorkAway, but it's all one word. I don't know if it's .com or .net or .org. Just fucking Google WorkAway, all one word, and you'll find it, all right? Get off my back. So anyways, I met Mata Shalanika when I was staying at a place in Northern California near Yosemite, and they just happened to pass through for a night and then um, stick around for like the whole next day when a big group of us went to Yosemite. And um, yeah, I, I got to know them very briefly when I saw them at Yosemite National Park, and then I ended up going to Southern California afterwards and they live, um, in the Los Angeles area. So I went up to Los Angeles for a couple days to get some work done and I met up with them and we ate amazing vegan nachos, vegan tacos, life-changing Los Angeles vegan food. It's kind of everywhere. And it's always like, 
um, vegan Mexican food. And it ju- just to have like savory, creamy, cheesy nachos that are vegan gluten-free is like, bitch, sign me up. I'm going to move to Southern California probably if the fires and earthquakes stop. So <laughs> maybe in my next life, maybe in the earth's next life, who knows? As long as I have vegan nachos, I'm there. So we met up and they, she came to my Airbnb and, um, yeah, we just recorded this episode after just nonstop talking. I don't know if you guys can hear the dinging of that cell phone. You know, what can I say? I'm traveling and I'm trying to record a podcast. It doesn't always go well. If you can hear it, I just sound like a crazy bitch, but you know what? I am. So it's fine. So we, we decided to re- record the podcast after talking for like five hours and we talked about a number of things. I love them very much. Um, but the reason I wanted to have them on is because like the first thing that we talked about when we met was, um, like veganism and, uh, how she has spent time doing vegan activism. Uh, so I, and, and then just, she's also, we didn't touch on it in this episode, but she's also like on a spiritual path. Um, in her words, it is the spiritual path of inner empowerment and self-realization. And so becoming an ally and doing activism um, for animals' rights has just kind of led her deeper into herself and in, onto her spiritual path. So we obviously had a lot of things in common. And so we just sat down and, and we talked about her experiences. So really excited for you guys to hear her perspective, some of the things that she has to say And, um, you know, we just talk about like, what is the way to advocate for animals is how how many different like avenues can you take with that? And I, I'm just glad that I got to sit down with Mata Shalanika today and have this conversation. So, I mean, you know, guys, I'm lying. It wasn't today. It was like three weeks ago. Shut up. Get off my back. Why are you guys so mean? (laughs) I'm a psycho. I'm sorry. So yeah, I think that I did it. Um, Mata Shalanika is on Instagram. I will link her information in the show notes like I always do and on my Instagram post about the episode. Um, I don't know. I love you guys. I miss you guys. I'm not officially taking appointments right now, but I have had people reach out. It, um, if, if, if you like have a question or if you want to just like do an impromptu reading, just, just reach out to me. And, you know, I am a little busy. I'm a little crazy, but, um, after May 17th, I will be in Taos, New Mexico for the whole summer. So I'll be rooted into one place and I'll be able to like actually give the podcast some attention and then open up some readings. Um, but anyways, I am (laughs) available. I would really like to be available, but I'm also, you know, floating around. Anyways, what's the point? I haven't sat down in front of the mic in forever. Can you tell that I'm rambling in this intro? I'm supposed to keep these intros short. It's going on eight minutes and 30 seconds at this point. Long story short is I love you guys. (laughs) I feel like that's always what I'm trying to say is that I love you and that I'm happy that you're here. And without, I want to say something else other than what I always say. So Instead of without further ado, maybe I should, should I edit out that sniffle? Nah, this is real. This is real Arizona allergies, bitch. Okay, I'm going to stop talking now and let you guys listen to this episode. So give a roaring, (laughs) give a roaring welcome to Mata Shalanika. Okay, so I want you. I'm always so aggressive right in the beginning. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Can you tell me about a time where you communicated with an animal and what that was like for you? Yes, there are many times. Um, The one that pops up in my head is with my cat. His name was Bodie. And he woke up in the morning and it was really cold in Los Angeles and where we lived and he wanted to go outside. 
And so I woke up and I followed him because he kept kneeling to me, telling me to follow him. Mm -hmm. And he took me to the back door leading to the yard and he just went, <laughs> and I said, what? No. Because I didn't want to open the door for him. It was too cold and he could run off and just disappear. And he just kept going. <laughs> and we just had a conversation about that for like two minutes, two long minutes. And, um, you know, I, I couldn't help it. I, I, I continued to argue and he just kept going on. <laughs> and finally... I just gave in because he kept trying to crawl on the door and he looked at me with his face and he knew what he wanted. And so therefore I opened the door and his tag wailed and he was happy out. And he did come home though. He did come home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that was my time with him. We just had a really very friendly argument about, you know, letting him out and having his freedom. And so I let him have his freedom. Yeah. Do you mm -hmm. think that he was like asking you specific, like what, what do you think like if he was, his meows were translated to English, what do you think that he was saying? Um, in translation, he would say, or he did say, please, I want to go, I want to go, please. <laughs> I just want to go, I've been home for so long. Like, I'm supposed to be outdoors, mom, please. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's how I feel. Like, I resonated with him. And in my spiritual practice, we live in Advaita, which is oneness. And so every soul is experiencing the same life that we are. And so I had to like live in his life and understand like psychologically and mentally that he felt um, stuck inside a home, especially breathing in the same air within the home, like after like eight hours of sleep. And um, yeah, and that's not how nature works for him. That's not how everyone should like live. Everyone should always have that freedom to like go outside Breathe in the great expanse of air and the vast space. Um, that's just how, like, we grew up, you know, living. Like, mm -hmm. we lived and slept under the stars. And my cat, of course, like, he comes from from many, many ancestors of, you know, you know, cheetahs, like, felons. And, and they live under the stars in the open space. So it was my turn to finally give him that freedom, too. Yeah. So I had to detach and let him have that freedom despite the fear of him never coming home but he always came home though mm -hmm. yeah that was always a fear of mine like letting my cats outside mm -hmm. when growing up and my mom like she was always really um trusting of the cats to come home but it was always just like a, like a childhood fear that they you know i mean like the worst was going to happen to them but it is such a beautiful thing when we we don't project our fears onto our animals and we just like let them be our themselves. And then we get to be surprised at like what, what happens then. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, mm -hmm. when I have learned about, um, the little bit that I know currently about dog training, like obedience training, um, the basics is top of the list of the basics is you have to trust your dog. And that's something that so many people struggle to even get there. They spend so much time on like, um, the positive reinforcement and how often do I give them treats and how often do I discipline them or do I discipline them and da 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 and it's like the number one thing is you have to trust your animal um, mm -hmm. because then they it's like it's almost like if you see almost like a channel of energy from like their heart to yours it's kind of the imagery that's coming to my mind now the trust opens up mm -hmm. but when you don't trust it's like uh like you're damning that energy flow but as soon as you trust it like it's it's, it, it's amazing to watch their behavior shift from like maybe causing mischief to just, just, just coming home, coming mm. home at night or like, um, not jumping on people anymore. If you have an overly excited dog or just like sitting when you tell them to sit, you know, it's like that trust. And so that's, that's really beautiful that you were able to experience that with Bodhi. Although like, you know, it, I mean, it, for me, at least I, I, as a child, I was like, oh my God, they're going to get in my car. They're never going to come home. They're going to find yeah. a new family. And like, <laughs> I mean, while it did happen, it happens like once with a cat, you know what I mean? As it does, you know, we've had many cats where mm -hmm. one didn't come home, but, um, I, I struggle with trying to control our, mm -hmm. our pets, you know, I don't even love the word pet so much. It's kind of been like, it's been made kind of gross, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? But, um, that's how I feel too. Yeah. yeah. I don't like saying, um, 
like I'm pet sitting. Mm -hmm. I don't like saying, um, I like, own this pet. Yeah. Right. Or that's, you know, because I've, like, done a lot of, like, you know, I, ha I literally, it's kind of annoying that I do this, but I love it about myself. I just say, like, I like to hang out with my friends. Or I'm, like, hanging out with my friend, and that means I'm dog sitting, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, but then, like, going to the dog park, and then, you know, people asking me questions about the dog, and then I'm like, oh, I'm not their human. or But that, but that doesn't even feel real, because, like, I am one of their humans. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And it's, like, the language around it, the more I... Um, explore my connection to animals the less I like owner pet pet sitting things like that yeah Cause that language because it makes it it's like we're taking away their autonomy yeah which they it's almost like they have to ask us permission to like exist and that's just like really backwards to me um but I do I do strongly believe that like every house needs like a dog and a cat at this point because so many are like euthanized every year you yeah, know what I mean so definitely. it's like Anyways, I'm sorry. I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of going down because I want to say like more, but like not every home can handle a dog and a cat and like some people would be abusive. And so it's like, yeah, there's so many things, especially with the breeding industry and just and producing, overproducing a massive amount of dogs and animals and it's cats. It's really sad. Yeah. It's like, I have a really hard time. One dog that I, I like love, like I'm obsessed mm -hmm. with her. Like she's my soul sister. She is a purebred and like she was bought from like a breeder. You know what I mean? And it's like. I I try to have those conversations with people before they've decided to get the dog, not mm -hmm. after they've gotten the dog. Because um, I the dog deserves all animals deserve equal amounts of love, no matter what their background is. And so like it's it's kind of like touchy. Also, some people have paid six hundred dollars for their dog. Yeah, which is like Absolutely. insane. Yeah, and that's not even for their shots or for their food mm -hmm. or for the things that they like actually need to sustain them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the breeding industry, it's, it's, and then like rescuers are left to like pick up the pieces of like breeding, um, like what, like, you know, when they have like health issues afterwards mm -hmm. and then it's like, then you have people that are in the rescue world that are literally like building wheelchairs for dogs from overbreeding, like for sanctuaries, sanctu large sanctuaries. Yeah. 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 Mm. It's a really, really big thing. And that's why for me, I, I just see like, oh, like every single animal, has a consciousness and soul just like us and therefore mm. i i can't put my ownership over this pet um over or claim it as mine because they can freely go when they want to mm -hmm. but they just so happily decide to want us to be responsible for them or mm -hmm. just want to live with us mm -hmm. and so that's why every time like i have any relationship with um any pets that I decide to take responsibility over, I never use the term mine or, oh, uh, that's that's my pet. Oh, I, I, I own that pet. Um, I'm very conscious of my language in that respect. And um, yeah, and I feel like it's just thrown out so, so easily too. Mm -hmm. And they're forced to wear so many things, so many garments that could really choke their necks, like mm -hmm. when they wear like turtlenecks or so. Um, <laughs> And so for me, very cute, but very problematic. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I, when I began researching more about how pugs are made too, I was just really disoriented to realize like, wow, like this, our human society is just consciously breeding these animals that is making them not even able to have a strong respiratory system because mm -hmm. these pugs can't breathe well because yeah. their, their snout is pushed down the way they're their throat and just physiologically of their respiratory system just because of the way they look that cute face and the small face and the the thick neck yeah they're not able to breathe well psychologically yeah. uh, physiologically and yeah. so they die you know much younger than they're supposed mm -hmm. to and um that's why like in our society today we we just have to we, we can't keep shopping for pets we just have to keep adopting mm-hmm and for me, like my, my pet died like at a really young age and it really brought a lot of lessons to me. Um, that's why I do plan to only adopt in the future and, and to only promote that in when other people are planning to um, take care of pets in the future too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I um, I try not to get like too... I try, like, I try not to get too frustrated, I guess, or like too direct when somebody is like looking for a dog and like they're looking at readers right away mm -hmm. like I always say something but I like have this moment of hesitation where I'm like 
how do I approach this so that they'll actually hear what I'm saying and not shut me down as like a preachy vegan, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I know that you do like vegan activism and Mm -hmm. like, so I want to know like what that process looks like for you and like Mm -hmm. how you decide how to approach. Do you go like, are you pouring buckets of blood on yourself to make a point? (laughs) You know, like I know that you said that you stand outside of like butch... I literally don't even know the word for it. I call it meat shops. What is it? Butchers? There's like slaughterhouses. Okay. Yeah. Meat shops. Yeah. But I didn't know. I think it's like a butcher, right? Is that the, you know how we like, we don't call, yeah, we don't call like pig meat pig. We call it pork. We don't call cow cow. We call it beef. We don't call like a meat shop, a meat shop. We call it a whole nother. Anyways. I mean, I guess butcher makes sense. (laughs) (laughs) Now that I'm saying it out loud, I'm coming back full circle. Anyway. So I want to know like, what that looks like for you and like um, kind of where it started, like the whole yeah, shebang. Like yeah. how do you decide like when to ease in? Do you ever ease in or you just kind of like, fuck you, don't buy a bread dog. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're a part of the fucking problem. Don't you see? Like millions of animals die a year just because they don't have a home, not because of any other reason, just because you guys fucking buy fashion dogs. Yeah. Like, how do you go, like, how do you go about that? Yeah, good question. And thank you for asking. So, um, when I was, I, I basically became, um, a vegan in 20, what was it again? It was, I think 2017 of January. Um, that was when I, I finally made that strong decision to never completely consume another animal or even get myself involved, um, or use or consume anything that harmed any sentient creature. Um, And I was vegan for a long time. Like I was living vegan for a long time uh, for at least another three years until I decided to finally advocate as a, a vegan advocate. And that was a really different story after that because for many years I always felt so frustrated with just seeing so much of, of, you know, animal tissues on on grocery aisles and just all this dairy products that was around me and constantly seeing a lot of um animal slaughter online you know Mm -hmm. it it was just tormenting for me and i'm a very sensitive person when i see this unnecessary death happening um in grocery markets in forever 21 in restaurants in people's lunch bags that I see everywhere. I just felt like I was just walking in violence, like seeing violence in every direction possible in Los Angeles. And of course, everywhere I traveled, which was like in Europe and India, everywhere. Thailand, a big, big part of Thailand definitely used a lot of um, um, meat, especially for like like their, their weekend... Um, swap meets where they basically had like large festivals and came together to eat seafood meats mangoes fruits just large food parties so i knew that just living vegan and following a vegan diet it was helping and i was contributing to a greater good but i wanted to be a contribute more of a greater good to humanity by just putting a positive message out there because what changed me um to be a vegan was from youtube videos Mm -hmm. i was I was straining a lot with like my emotions and with a low state of being and depression and low energy and just not being able to feel empowered in myself many years ago when I graduated high school. And I wanted a complete rejuvenation and rebirth. And I looked into vegetarianism Mm -hmm. and I was just hearing a lot of stories of how them not eating carcass, um, corpse, helped them feel more pure, free and light in their body. And that made me escalate to become a vegan. Um, So long story short, I I just wanted to have that same positive impact Mm -hmm. by putting that positive message out there. And so I decided to become a a vegan advocate um, practically in the last half year or so, or no, I think it was since last July of 2020, I decided to start uploading more um, videos of me talking about veganism Mm -hmm. online. And, um, it was my way to just plant the seeds of awareness. 
and talking on a YouTube platform was easier than talking to people in real life because there's no feedback you know mm-hmm. i'm just talking mm-hmm. to a camera i'm not being triggered by anyone's words <laughs> i'm i put out a script of what to say in order for me to make a seven minute video and let this video spread across the platform and that was my way to practice how to diligently say things where people could receive it mm-hmm. but that was finally like okay like i love this but i want to interact with more people so I began to join um, the other vegan advocates in Los Angeles by going to um, beach cleanups, silent vegan walks um, on Venice um, Beach, mm-hmm. where we just walk down holding large signs of these animals who were murdered, um, what happens in the industries, um, posters that say, um, you know, stop killing animals and start living vegan. Mm-hmm. And... And then I began going to, um, yeah, to, to, I haven't gone to slaughterhouses yet, but I do plan on going to those vigils in the future Mm because I do want to really witness it myself. But I've been, um, I did protest multiple times at these butcher shops and places that sell hams, um, especially on days when it was Easter, when, you know, there's so many customers and that was a different setting, you know? That was a very different setting where I wasn't talking to just a camera. There was not input. I was very respectful towards the camera because there was no person in front of me. But when I went to these actual protests, is meeting with so many strangers on the streets who either flicked their fingers at me or got angry with me because I was, you know, preaching or expressing mm-hmm. my free speech, or I had other vegan advocates who were getting very angry and, you know, would um, express a lot of anger towards protesters. There was just a lot of things happening psychologically. And I knew I didn't want to be in the space where I looked like, where I only saw people who ate meat or consume this as bad people or mm-hmm. perpetrators, because they're mm-hmm. not. We're all conditioned. We are the product of society. I don't blame people for eating meat or I don't blame people for being bad just because they eat meat. I was there before and I just have empathy and understanding and I don't want to be that person who just labels vegans as just heroes because we, everyone can be vegan and ev- even people um, who eat meat can become vegan and they mm-hmm. can become an ally towards a great, great cause mm-hmm. and I didn't just yeah, it was it was kind of that. I was just like looking in psychologically, like what can I do as a fully effective vegan and not see this world as as Games of Thrones where there's just bad guys and good guys. Mm-hmm. And that's that's the reality of this vegan protest. Um and so I looked in and after a lot of like deep contemplation and meditation, I came to recognize that I have to really experience myself as as those people like the theory of advaita oneness like how do i want to be spoken to if i were in their shoes Mm -hmm. like the whole point is to just get them to listen Mm -hmm. we we can't win an argument if we're screaming because immediately when i get yelled at by my dad or by anyone outside of me that arousal pumps up Mm -hmm. that cortisol pumps up Immediately, my body just gets frightened. I'll just push away and I'll just run away. Mm -hmm. And that vegan message is not passed into me. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm projecting that to the world, no one's going to listen. And then more animals are going to get, you know, endangered. And so the best way is to talk to them as myself, as as your own loved one. Mm -hmm. So through YouTube videos, I, I compassionately just educate what's been happening with the animal industry. I educate like what's a great way to transition to be a vegan. Um, And on the streets, I learned to just talk to them as if they're just really close friends like me Mm -hmm. who just wanted to learn, Mm -hmm. even if they're flicking their fingers at me. Or even if people on the streets come and say, oh, I came to this this ham, um, this ham store just to purchase this ham in front of you. And I will not react. I will just say, okay, well, I'm so sorry you have to be like that, but just move on. 
Because I know that I can't waste any of my energy towards irrational people. Mm -hmm. I'm just here to spread the positive message. Yeah. And that's the biggest thing because I think in our, our health and as vegan advocates, it's a lot of frustration, mm -hmm. a lot of anger. And I know it's so much pent up emotions that we just want to explode it to the world. But we have to be like effective communicators at the same mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole point is just being fully effective and seeing these people as our own, no matter how many times that we feel beaten down. And... Um, yeah, so far, it's not fully perfect yet, but it's an everyday practice of being a compassionate, effective speaker. And um, I also, I, I'm planning to be a nurse and a midwife, too. So that's another way I'm trying to implement and plant the vegan um, message towards everyone um, is by fusing a lot of awareness in a lot of these patients that I've met over the last year and a half. Um, and also in, in the health industry too, there's just so many people who are constantly sick because they consume the karmas of eating dead flesh or dairy. And because they consume this violence, their body is going through violence. They're going through cancers. They're going through fibroids. They have hysterectomies. They have acne, you know, over bleeding. Um, and that's just like women reproductive health. And so for me, I, I, I have the power to um, be part of the health world and plant these seeds of vegan positivity by sharing them the facts. Like, look, science says that when you eat this, this is what you, you experience as a consequence in health. Mm -hmm. And... And then I share them more about the actual reality of the meat industry too. Mm -hmm. And it's the best way to have these conversations like with people when they're so vulnerable, when they just need help. Like I just shared them what saved my life since I had a lot of health issues growing up too. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of weight issues. I had anorexia before because I was so scared of eating too much, eating too little and just trying to be skinny. And I would just go days starving, mm -hmm. days, you know, consuming like a whole Starbucks frappuccino and chips and chocolate bars and mm. then going to days of just completely not eating at all for like a week and just eating bread and and veganism changed my life where I knew how to eat the foods that nourish me and I could eat it in abundance because this food was was healthy and not hurting anyone so um from my experiences of healing my body through veganism and my activism and seeing what happens to these animals i i have this incredible these incredible um tools to also bring it to my work as well and mm -hmm. plant seeds in any conversation i have with patients so it's really like that like in any conversation you don't have to be on the streets always protesting in any conversation when you're with your coworkers or you're meeting new people in class or you know you go on dating sites or you are on YouTube and you're making podcasts about cats and animals or um, you know fashion like any conversation you have with the world and you're a hundred years on this earth as a human you can always just plant the seeds of awareness to anyone mm -hmm. and especially when you make them feel connected with you because mm -hmm. when you have that love and connection with someone they could hear but when you make them feel like they are um, a bad person because they're eating meat that will close them up and that is the last thing that we ever want to do because no one's not stupid we are just a product of our society and everyone needs to be deconditioned in the most compassionate way possible mm -hmm. yeah wow good answer <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was a little long. No, I love it. <laughs> That's great. That's a great answer. I have so many things. Um, yeah, I have a really hard time and um, I can't like, because like we were talking before we started recording when I stopped eating meat when I was like, I don't know, like 16 or something. I was just happened to be like at a concert and they just happened to there be like a, a PETA. Um, and I know PETA is problematic. PETA is super problematic. Um, but I saw like a video 
mm-hmm. they had like put together um, just about like your your classic animal agriculture suffering, right? Um, pigs getting beaten, chickens getting stomped on, all of the good mm-hmm. the good stuff. Um, and I before I like was really diving into like my, I guess like my energetic connection to the animal kingdom, spiritual connection, just beyond like me, like loving animals and wanting to advocate for them. I like, I would have this reaction like in my body when somebody would show me a video of, of, or just, I I would happen to see a video or a picture of, of an animal suffering. Like it would just, it would make my whole body feel like, like ill, like defeated, um, hollow. Um, it wasn't not ever fucking funny to me. It was never something that I could just watch and be like, Oh, well that's sad and move on. Like it would, it haunts me. Like I could still have like images in my minds of videos in my mind of, I guess minds, I could have Mm -hmm. multiple minds, um, Mm -hmm. of, of videos that I've seen. Like I still have like pictures burned into my mind of animals suffering. And like, I, I always felt like, um, cause at a young age I was told that I was like really sensitive and emotional and I took things personally and this and that. So that's always been like a theme of my life. So when I started having these reactions with animals, my first instinct was like, oh, maybe I'm overreacting. This is something I just need to work on something like that. And I kind of always just push it off to the back of my mind. Cause it's not often that I see videos of animal suffering. Like I kind of, um, I've seen enough of it. I don't need to see more of it. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, I feel like I can be a, um, effective advocate an effective advocate without having to watch animals being tortured online. Mm -hmm. Because I think that that's just, it like fucks me up, you know, like that's like the, the least poetic way to say it. It just fucks me up. Like it like ruins me. Like it, it, I feel it in my bones. Like I feel their pain in the deepest parts of who, like my physical body and my energetic body. And so Um, I have a really hard time and I repress a lot of, um, it feels like rage, but it's just rage because I'm so sad. Mm -hmm. Um, but when I, and I'm sure this has been an experience of yours too. And people are Mm -hmm. like, I don't know how you do it being vegan. I just love Mm -hmm. cheese, Mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, it just feels, um, disrespectful to the suffering and it feels, um, I not even it's not disrespectful to me and like my beliefs yeah. cuz it's not about me. You know, like I decided to go vegan um because I mean I'd already not eaten meat for like 10 or 12 years at that point and I was just like well being vegan is just like the other it's 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 it is like being a it's a way that I can take direct action, like like advocacy for animals um in my life and make like conscious decisions. Um and also I just realized like I believe that I've been an animal in like a lot of my past lives. Mm -hmm. And so like, I feel like I came to be, I'm a human in this incarnation to help. I'm not here to speak for the animals. I'm here to remind people that animals are speaking to them and that people that you can hear your animals. Like I don't, I don't, we, we, we take a lot from animals. I don't want to take their voice. You know what I mean? I think it sounds poetic or heroic to say I speak for the animals, but it just seems like another human centric idea of like advocacy. You know what I mean? Mm. And so I'm just here to remind people that like they can hear their animals. Um, but knowing that it was like, why I don't fucking need to eat meat. I was like, if I've been an animal in all my past lives, I've eaten other animals to survive in this life. I don't need to eat animals to survive. Mm. I'm not here to eat my brothers and sisters to survive. You know what I mean? I don't need to do that. Um, but I guess what my, what I'm trying to say is that like I just feel so much rage and I feel like it gets really condensed and I don't I'm not able to like communicate it clearly mm-hmm. and I I I wholeheartedly agree with you that like you cannot yell something at somebody and have them hear you yeah. because I've had people yell things at me yeah that maybe a year later I actually believed a week later I believed but when they were yelling it at me there's no fucking way I was hearing them you know mm-hmm. um and it's just like, you know, I mean, it, it's it, that fuck that balance is so it's so challenging for me to yeah. find. And I do think, though, like, I think that my first experience with this was like when I first became like a feminist, you know, mm-hmm. and then like who some people would say like, oh, but, you know, like the, the radical feminist and this, this and that. And it's, it's like, oh, OK, well, and I would say I would like say things like, oh, well, you know, um, not all radical feminists speak for the whole feminist movement or something like that. But as I get older, it's like. 
I, I don't know if that's my energy necessarily. I think I go through phases of it. I can be really fluid where I do have like burn it all down energy. And like, I don't care about your fucking feelings energy, you know, when I'm like, um, advocating for something. Um, but I, I do think that it's important that certain movements have that like arsenal energy in them. I feel like it, it moves, it, it, it moves the, the cause forward. Whereas like, and not everybody has to be out there like, you know, I mean, I'm sure that you've seen like um, artists do mm -hmm. like t do like animal torture to themselves, like mm -hmm. you know, you know, and I'm, and so it's like, but not everybody, not every vegan advocate has to do that. That's not everybody's role, you know, and um, but there's value in that. It's not like, anyway. So mm -hmm. and I guess I just like I, I if I don't advocate for the animal in the moment, cause, like there have been times where it's like. I didn't say something in the moment and like, I'd, I'd never forgive myself. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. And so it's like, it's worth just being, and I don't know why true. I was, what? Being true to yourself. Being true. Letting, yeah. letting yourself express no matter what the consequences are. And I was just judging yeah. myself based off of other people's expectations of like preachy vegans. Like mm -hmm. I'm, at the beginning of this podcast, I said something, I was like, don't worry, I'm not going to be the preachy vegan. And then the more I dive into this work, I literally like, it doesn't, like, of course I'm the preachy vegan, like fucking mm -hmm. label me however you want to. Like, this is like, like somebody has to acknowledge the suffering. Yeah. Like somebody has to acknowledge the suffering. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. And I'm thinking about like so many different like topics of like, you know, obviously like systematic racism, um, indigenous cultures, um, like, uh, the patriarchy, things like that. Like everything. And, it, and it's like it all, like it's all these different areas where you have to have people that are arsenal that are just like fuck you it mm -hmm. needs to stop and then other people that kind of just like come at it with like love it's it's both it's it, yeah. it is both but i just don't think my role is always like because like you said it, i just don't think that they're gonna listen right no no right. no change is gonna happen and then you just have people that hate vegans now yeah and a lot of people yeah. i all and wholeheartedly believe that most people do not ever want an animal to suffer the way that they do and the hands of the meat industry. And I feel like wholeheartedly a lot of people are not fully aware of the suffering. That's so true because I, I just I just like listened to um, someone and they told me that like the United States just set, the, um, they just had a census. And in the census, the poll said, um, asked, um, would you want to ban completely animal slaughter and animal farming? And at least 53% said yes. And so a large majority of America knows that they don't want it. Yeah. But they still continue because it's just what they have already too. Right. But they're just not living to their own morals and their moral codes because it's already so easy to live the status quo that we live. Right. But you totally make a right point. Like a lot of people don't want to see this. A lot of people don't want to see this violence. They don't want animal suffering to happen. But they're just being contradictory and, you know, hypocritical and not realizing the reality of it right and for me i i had to stand at cubes um cubes in in the vegan movement we basically go on the streets anywhere any popular place and um multiple people with you know mask because we're trying to remain anonymous um not put our face like just hide our mask as well as holding a large tv and the tv will basically project um, footages of how pigs are suffering in a pile of feces, um, pigs, you know, being separated from their mothers, cows being separated from their mothers, how animals are slaughtered, how chickens are separated from other genders, and then males are immediately, you know, killed after that because they're worthless to the industry. And so we project this, um, this footage on the streets a lot just because um, this is a peaceful way just to show it to people. Mm -hmm. And I, there's people that just stop and that's when we could actually have a conversation with them. We don't force people to have this conversation with us, but you know, it's just the way how society is. There's, there's so many people that pass by us. 80% mm -hmm. of the people, you know, had to go and get more dinner or just had to go to their parking lot just to drive in their cars. But there are some people who are actually really curious and wanted to learn about mm -hmm. it. And I think that there's so many people who are so de desensitized to these issues because 
they're just not awakened to the real matters here and they're just so focused on their own personal lives and it's it's one of those realities that i faced protesting on the streets or even doing these vegan cubes by showing all of these um these footages of animal agriculture and animal farming a lot of people just pass by or some people just yell out meat 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 Ugh. and it does frustrate me and i it so sounds like trump much trump food. trump yeah you know, it sounds like the same energy exactly you know, like it, it feels like that like it just it feels like it's so frustrating and I feel oh, you and so I resonate gross. with you and everyone goes through it. Everyone goes through it and it's it's one just, it sounds like things. fear on their part. It sounds like fear on their part. And then also I did want it to is. touch on my best friend who I talked to you about earlier, who was an environmental vegan, mm -hmm. brought up a really good point. Like when I would get so fucking frustrated with like the suffering and she, she was like being, being able to be vegan is a privilege. Like being able to choose that lifestyle is a privilege because some people literally like don't, they don't have time to think outside of like, I just need to feed my kids. I need to go to my second job. I just need yeah. to, you know, it's like they're in such survival mode. Maybe they have a certain amount of money um, for food each week. And maybe like, I mean, the, the public school system did not educate me on how yeah. to like meat and dairy are in sugars in like the, the triangle, the fucking, I don't know, food triangle that yeah. says that you're supposed to, what you're supposed to eat. Yeah. Like, so like if you just have a basic education, like most people in this country do, you don't know mm -hmm. that like dairy is like everyone's lactose intolerant. You don't know that like, um, if you cut, if you either stop eating meat or cut back on your consumption, like it could do wonders for your health or just even like adding vegetables or just even like having reverence, you know? Yeah. And sometimes people, all they have in their pocket is $5 and they can get five cheeseburgers from McDonald's. Yeah. So it's right. like this huge problem that is so systemic. Um, and it's disgusting because so many people have their money, their money in it. Mm -hmm. And so many like, it's, it's like with oil and like healthcare and like animal agriculture is right up there. But like, for some reason, we're just not talking about it yet. Yeah. You know, and also another um, thing that I've come into um, contact with is like some people have are like their family, their money, their well-being is in the dairy industry. It's in the meat industry. That's the only way that for yeah. generations that they've survived. And so it's like, and a lot of the times when you're like raising the cows, you're not the one slaughtering the cows. So you can kind of like separate yourself from it. And then there's all that propaganda that like cows are stupid. Pigs are stupid. I remember hearing when I was young, like, um, don't you know why we eat cows and pigs? You know, cause they're dumb. They're dumb and they're easy to like mm -hmm. kill and eat and stuff. It's uh, like, but they're so smart, they're so they're smart so and they're smart. so caring and they're so like, they're multidimensional and multi multifaceted. I mean, a fucking like fly is 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 has inherent value like everything has value everything um that spiders is living too. yeah I like love all spiders i love all life like i mean yes. like now if a mosquito's coming for me and sucking my blood i might smack <laughs> it you know what i mean like if a, if a bug's gonna like try to kill me you know it's, it's you like you gotta do what you gotta do you gotta do what you gotta yourself. do exactly yeah. you know and it's like because so, i love your life too you yeah know? exactly to exactly and so <laughs> Yeah, I just, and, and, and that's something that's been really humbling to me. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, okay. Um, and I think maybe that's too why, like, may, some people just walk past you too, because maybe they have so much trauma in their heart mm -hmm. from a childhood or, you know, a, their current life. They're just so deeply, like, unsatisfied or, like, stressed out or their cup is just empty. Yeah. And they don't have the space to see any more suffering. Because if they do, that might be the final fucking straw for them. Yeah. You know? Because I've right. been there before. I've been there before where I'm like, if I yeah. see one more video, if I have to see one more sad thing, like, I'm defeated. Yeah. I am defeated, you know? And so it's, like, part of... I, I, I And I feel like in this conversation, I feel like I'm, I'm thinking about, like, my work and what what can I do in like my life, like my life's work. And it's like, remind people of the joy, the inherent joy that animals bring them, the comfort, yes, the, yeah. the just, just literally like, I love when I just see people just watch animals, you know, when you're mm -hmm. on a trail and like you spot an animal and everybody's like, Oh my God, look over there. You know? And like, the, and it's like, we're all having this collective, like, Oh my God, look an animal, you yeah. know? And it's like, Oh, or like when you like are, are just, I'm constantly out with friends and like, we'll see a dog do a funny thing. And it's just like, we're so in the present moment with the dog, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, just like how animals connect us to each other and to ourselves and to the natural world. And, and make like, us forget our phones. And like when I was in Yosemite, I just saw, 
I was biking and I had to stop because I saw five deers in the meadows. Wow. And they were just walking, but they, they were in, they were, they were happy with my space. They, they knew I was very peaceful. So they were walking, you know, past me and just trying to cross the street where people were dri- drivers were driving. And, um, I was just, I stopped. And I remember I was just wanting to take pictures of Yosemite and Mount Dome, but I was just so mesmerized by how how innately connected I was with them. Like how they did the same things that I would do as a human, just check both streets, mm-hmm. just check both sides if there was any cars to, so that I could safely make my way. Mm-hmm. And it was beautiful because they made their way past and then they did it just like me. They ran in, in case, like as soon as they saw a biker and they just went ran across the street to a different meadow and I was just recognizing like wow like this is just so beautiful and in my thoughts I was like wow like I am that same animal just in different form and different levels of hair and different mm-hmm. facial features different height mm-hmm. but I am just like that deer I, I am that animal too and it's just beautiful when when um, I do go to like um, animal rescue farms, mm-hmm. I go to this place called Kindred Spirits Care Farm in Chatsworth, California, and I give high props to them. Um, the founder, Karen, and her husband, they're incredible down-to-earth people, and they rescue a lot of these slaughterhouse animals such as goats, alpacas, llamas, pigs, um, cows, they're getting there. Um, cows need a lot of vet care, which is highly, highly expensive, but they're trying to get cows on the property as well. Um, lambs, goats, sheep. there's just so many animals. Chickens, chickens are so big there. Turkeys as well. And with this large property, a lot of people can come volunteer and have a deep connected relationship with these animals. Mm-hmm. Um, And we do so much volunteer work. We're building a permaculture farm. We we, um, basically clean out the mulch and the poop where the animals stay and walk around. And Mm -hmm. these goats and these animals just come up to you. And I remember I just, I was staring at a goat (laughs) and his head turned and and it was facing, you know, one direction. And I saw his left side of his face. And he had so much of a facial chin hair and had a mole right there on his bottom of the chin. And his eyes were just staring straight. And these goats have like very rectangular pupiled eyes and a nose, nostrils just like me. And a very Italian looking nose, just <laughs> very, very big, big bridge, right? And just a large forehead, mm-hmm. just like just like my substitute teacher. <laughs> and I was just recognizing, wow. These animals literally look like me, a human, or this guy looked like just a man. Yeah. Just a man with a mole, with, with the same nose structure, with same eyes, with same forehead. With, but they just had more fur. They just had a different shape of head. They mm-hmm. just had a different body. But these animals are just like humans. And it was such an experiential healing experience. Like we could watch all these videos online and talk to so many vegans and and do so much research but really having that relationship with an animal is such a godly experience of Mm. a connection Mm -hmm. it's unspeakable it's beyond words and it really makes you experience these animals from the heart level that we are Mm -hmm. so disconnected from Mm -hmm. and um for all you viewers i i highly recommend just googling if you're ever in Los Angeles, I highly recommend going to um, Kindred Spirits Care Farm. It's very, it's such a a great way to connect with animals since you get to volunteer there and develop such a tight knit relationship with these animals. There's also Gentle Barn, um, and of course, there's just so many you know sanctuaries across the whole world. There's a lot of sanctuaries that used to be like slaughterhouses, and you know those slaughterhouse. Um, owners stopped and converted them to um, sanctuaries, animal sanctuaries, because people realize the reality of the harm that they're doing for killing these animals. And so there's always that possibility, like even though no matter how long we are part of a certain system, a certain system of animal agriculture and dairy, 
there's always a possibility to change because man the reason why meat and cheese and burgers is so cheap is because the government unfortunately in the u.s and the uk we subsidize a lot of our tax money goes a shit ton into this into dairy into meat into this processed food because the government just wants it cheap so more people could buy it and that's just the way people lobby and imagine a world when all those subsidies could just go straight into vegetation into just raising and and harvesting and and growing more vegetables and fruits and making these fruits and vegetables cheap so that people in food deserts not only have to just consume cheap food that is unhealthy that is meat based that are cheeseburgers but making these healthy foods more affordable and really educating the world about it educating mothers you know having like council meetings or or just the mayors and and councilmen and just the government establishing more education like class education about like how can we cook you know purely just more plant-based foods in our in our diet like right. how do you cook lentils how do you cook beans that are so cheap to to buy you know you could buy canned yeah. beans you could buy like large dried beans and make so much beans yeah. for like a whole month <laughs> i can make all the hummus i want just by purchasing a 10 dollar um bag of dried chickpeas and yeah i, I know people say being a vegan is, is definitely a luxury but i think it's a luxury for a reason because of how corrupt the system is with us subsidizing and giving so much of our tax money to dairy industries and and meat industries but the system can't be permanent because veganism is really increasing at such multifold today can't imagine how it's going to grow like bitcoin in the future in many years from here yeah (laughs) (laughs) that's a good thing to compare it to yeah Yeah. like no one knew that bitcoin was going to be popular this guy just invested his bitcoin on pizza you know and then the pizza became like a billion dollar pizza well it needs to be a vegan pizza next time (laughs) (laughs) come on brad make it a vegan pizza Also, like, I would love a 20-minute video on how to cook lentils because I fuck it up every time. Oh, you do? Uh, it's always so much liquid. They're never cooked. I'm like, I cooked you for, like, five hours. Oh, buddy. What the fuck is happening? Yeah, I think I've only tried, like, twice. But I'm, like, a vegan who doesn't know how to cook lentils. Gotta get it together. That's um, so funny. I, yeah. On my vegan YouTube channel, I only have a few videos because I've been working a lot. But I, with my um, time off from school and work, I, I'm trying to upload more videos I'm just talking on these YouTube videos, but I want to like cook more and show people yeah. more how I cook. Like how easy it is. How easy it is. Like how easy it yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And I, I do think that like, I, I believe that collectively and like, I, I guess I can only speak for the United States because that's where I live, but mm-hmm. I do feel like collectively we are going through, we are just shifting and changing as, as humanity, humans are are becoming more sensitive and more aware. And it's, it's in every aspect, you know, it's in with our, our sexuality. Um, it's in with racial justice. It's Mm -hmm. with, um, you know, burning down the patriarchy and like endless other examples I can't think of right now, but veganism is up there or not even like just animals rights in general. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Just like, like we just, and so, like I said earlier, it's like, you know, you have people that, you know, um, like, obviously I want to like scream at people sometimes, but it is just that, like, it is just reconnecting people to animals. Like, can you just see what happens? Like, um, that documentary, my octopus teacher, Mm -hmm. have you seen it? No, dude, (laughs) I was so, for some reason I was so resistant to watching it for so long. I don't know why I, um, I'm a sensitive person and I like, I tear up a lot or I'll shed like one or two tears. Like when I see like a beautiful act of like kindness or something, I'll be like moved and I'll be like, Oh, it's so beautiful. I fucking sobbed at the end of that movie. Like I haven't, like, it's rare that I'm just like, <laughs> like I was like a mess. And it was literally like one of the most beautiful movies I've ever seen. But the, 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 the the basis of the mo- it's literally a love story it is it's you think it's going to be a documentary about the ocean and about like this one octopus and while it is that it is literally a love story it's like guy guy meets octopus and like goes and visits the octopus every single day for over a year 
And by the end of it, like he was this very, like he was like struggling, like I'm going to give the whole fucking movie away, but he was like, um, very like nine to five plugged into like the matrix plugged into like, you know, capitalism, got to go to work, got to do my thing. And then like, was having a creative funk needed to step out of it, went back to the ocean where he grew up, met the octopus. And by the end of it, um, he realized he was like, my relationship with this octopus showed me the value in life, no matter how small it is. Mm. He was like, before my relationship with this octopus, like I never really like paid attention to animals. Yeah. Like I never really like thought about it. He never like had that perspective. And just because he happened to stumble upon this octopus and he happened to like dedicate, you know, a certain amount of time to getting to know her and like learning from her, like it changed his whole perspective. And I was like, that's why... I wake up every day because animals teach us, they, they teach us to, uh, uh, about ourselves, about, they, they remind us, they're a reminder, they're a connector. It is like literally the most beautiful mm. fucking gift. Like the fact, uh, yeah. God, I could just go on. Ugh. I feel like I don't even have like the words, but like, uh, yeah, it's, so... I could just feel it from your energy too. Yeah. And I, I totally, totally resonate. And I, I, I really look forward to watching that film too. Dude, you have to, but you're going to cry. Okay. I love crying too. Me I too. love crying for that purpose of yeah. connection. <laughs> <laughs> As she says with a huge smile on her face. <laughs> so, um, it's just a healing experience. Like I, I feel like very disconnected when I do my nine to five type of schoolwork and, and work in general. And, and I know like when I was not vegan, I was so focused and ingrained in my own life yeah. and my own box and my own goals and my own worries that were my own personal life. It wasn't related to animals. It wasn't related to the greater world. Um, it was just my own personal stresses, anxieties, worries, jobs, applying to school. And when I became vegan, that was when it really changed. I, I just began going to these animal sanctuaries. And I knew that my life and role as this, this healer, this, you know, being a student, all of that was temporary. It was like I... I would go to Kindred Spirits Care Forum. I, I go like at least like a few times a month during my Saturdays off. And every time I volunteer there, it is like I don't have my roles in the Matrix anymore. Mm -hmm. I feel like I am not this girl who just studies, who just gets into school and, you know, um, who is trying to serve her purpose in this role and my many different roles that I have I just feel like I'm just connected I just feel like I'm just like those animals with clothes on <laughs> <laughs> so weird that we wear clothes I know right, right? right? That's so weird and glasses isn't it weird well I mean I need to see <laughs> I need to I have contact <laughs> yeah on. I can see them in your eyes yeah it's weird that like nudity is like illegal in places isn't yeah that strange it is it's our bodies we're all naked underneath the clothes anyways we're all naked. We're all naked. <laughs> <laughs> naked, sleeping naked is incredible too. That's like the only way I sleep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it depends on the situation. Oh, yeah. When I was at Annie's house, I only slept naked. <laughs> Hi, Annie. <laughs> Love you, Annie. <laughs> Yeah, I just, I think I, I really like to use the language of like animals and then like uh, non-human animals or mm -hmm. like animals and human animals. It's because we are animals. It's like we just are like, you know, some people believe, you know, that we were, you know, what that the missing link that mm -hmm. like aliens came in. And that's why we're like, we're so vastly, I'm using air quotes, different than animals because mm -hmm. like we're half alien or something. And then some people, it's just like technology, like our, our, the industrial revolution, like something like disconnected us from like being animals, like we are, we have egos and our egos are like, Oh, like we walk on two feet. We're better than you. We yeah. have thumbs. Yeah. It's so ridiculous. Yeah. It's so like, and like what of, what an interesting like puzzle and like game to like give humans to like, to, to just like come back to ourselves. Like we are like in the natural world and then like some sort of like game is introduced, whether it be by our own minds or by technology or both because technology is our minds. Um, and then like, 
to be like, oh, well, you're, you're better than animals. And we're like, ha ha ha, we're better than animals. And then like all of a sudden, like, we're, once we like tried that out and it's not yeah. working, we come back around. It's like, oh, we are the animals. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like a weird, why did we like, why did we choose that game? Like, why did yeah. we choose like that, like code to crack? You know yeah. what I mean? And it's like, we spent so long um suffering with our with ourselves and and like causing suffering yeah um yeah yeah it's a crazy thing like how we forget that we are innately connected to nature including animals because animals are nature themselves and you know we're working and then we get so stressed and burnt out in the matrix yeah that we have to go and take a vacation out in nature yeah. Like, isn't it crazy That's how wild. unfortunate that is that we forget that we're connected and we have to spend money to just take a day off from work or even like a month's trip and just go back into nature go just back to into reconnect. nature and everybody's going back into nature mm-hmm. like 2020 was like beautiful in that like I mean, I am an outdoorsy. I'm an outdoorsy kind of gal, you know? It sounds <laughs> That's so cheesy. That's where we met. <laughs> True. Um, and so, like, I love yeah. the trails, and I love, like, getting away from people on the trails. It's, like, a nice escape. And then 2020 came, and, like, fucking everybody was on the trails. And at first, I was all like, get out of my nature. This is my nature. And then, like, I <laughs> took a step back, and I was like, all right, Ashley, just you know, figure it out. You're introverted ass you'll figure out another way to to (laughs) to decompress but then i was like holy shit this is beautiful like people are like they're taking their entire family out outside and like i was thinking about like well like vegan activism it starts with children like so many children like they like they do not want to eat animals like Mm -hmm. they have no idea like if i i don't think i'll ever have kids but if i were to ever have kids like um, I like, I've, I've heard people like want to parent like two different ways where they'll just feed their kid, like meat, cheese, whatever, until they want to decide to not eat it. But I would do it the opposite. It's like, mm-hmm. I would only raise my kid like vegan mm-hmm. and then like the absolutely no animal products because, and then like, if they, if, if they're raised in my household with animals, the reverence for animals with like all of our, you know, animals that we would have in the house and then they still decide they want to eat them and that's their choice. You know yeah, what I mean? That's my belief too. But like yeah. so many children, they have no idea what's in their awesome chicken nugget. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like, they, they're just like, Oh, this crunchy thing I dip in ketchup and like, yeah. it's amazing. You know what I mean? Or like a hot dog, like all these things that are like, so easy and disposable. It's like they have no idea that it's like the little piggy from their bedtime book or they yeah. have like all they have like a farm's worth of like stuffed animals, you know, and like how many Disney movies and like Disney movies in the way that they present um animals to me is problematic because they like romanticize them and then we stop res- respecting the wildness of animals yeah. and we think that they're approachable and then animals kill humans and then we're like, "Oh, animals are bad." And then we go out and kill them. So anyways, that is problematic. Yeah. <laughs> Mini right. tangent, but um Children are so, children and animals just represent like innocence. You know what I mean? And they are so inherently connected. And it's just like, anyways, that's like, that's where to start with vegan activism is just with children. And like, it's really unfortunate that like, that parents don't give children the option to decide for themselves if they want to eat the piggy from their, right. you know, if that's their choice and that's their choice and then that's fine. But like, I don't think that like starting my child out as vegan is like, they're not missing anything Mm -hmm. from that. You know what I mean? It's like once, but once you have like been raised for like, I don't know when, when does a child become conscious of what they want to eat? I think that generations are becoming more and more conscious, but say like five, six, six at the earliest, they're like, Oh, I don't want to eat meat. But like for that long, it hasn't been their choice. You know what I mean? And then maybe that's traumatic for them after they realize like, Mm. you know what I mean? Because to children, it's, there's no difference between a pig and their dog. Like there's no difference at all. And so a big thing too, I, um, it, it, you're, you're so right about like this, the most important thing we could do is like teach our generations, um, our younger generations, the kids, because it, you really, we, we become so deeply ingrained with this this ideology that you know meat is just an objectified thing Mm -hmm. and that animals are just things that we can use for labor and to eat and to milk um and that is really fundamentally causing us to have all of this discrimination like Mm -hmm. it's it what it's what speciesism and this belief that we are better than one we are one species better than another that's so deep-rooted and all other forms of discrimination like racial discrimination um homosexuality um sexism racial genocides racial discrimination everything 
all because of one thinking is better than another. Yeah. And it's beautiful, like, how when we just decide to teach these kids at a very young age that we have to love everything because everything is sacred. Yeah. Every animal is deserves that life just because they are alive and that you are as equal as that animal. Like how beautiful when that kid grows up and sees other black kids, other white kids, other Asians, other people of color, other people who love the same gender, other transgenders, like how easy for that kid to love that person too yeah. when they just learn to love that same animal. Yeah. And you're right. It definitely starts off with, you know, the children since it's so easy they receive everything like sponges when they're yeah, kids. Yeah, yeah. You hear that, folks? Get them while they're young. Teach them young. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like you don't even have to really teach them. They just already know they that. Know. It's just kind of like uh, positive reinforcement the way yeah. that they're already going. Fucking, oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been great. I mean, I know we're right at an hour. I'm, like, tired. We ate a fucking... We had a vegan feast. <laughs> Me too. We had vegan nachos and tacos, and, like, it was amazing. But I, I need some hot tea now. Um, where... Well, thank you for coming to thank my you podcast. So much. Yeah. Where yes. can people find you if they, like, want to connect with you or, like, what's your YouTube channel, if you have an Instagram, things that you want to plug? Yeah, yeah. I have... Um, a- I have two YouTube channels. I'm known to like create so many accounts on so many platforms, <laughs> but this one I'm actually very integrated to. I have a vegan YouTube channel. Um, that's where I, I post a lot about like my understandings and how to help people transition to living on a plant-based and vegan lifestyle. I have a channel where I just create like a lot of my creative outlet, like my music, um, my art, and then I do have an Instagram. It's under Mada Shalanika. It's quite long. Um, M-A-D-H-A-S-H-A-L-I-N-I-K-A. <laughs> I'll also long. type it out for you guys. And it might be long, yeah. but just deal with it. I'll just give her the handles and then she'll be happy to put in the description. Yes. Is that in your YouTubes under that too? Yeah. Okay. Um, no, they're, they're different names. So I had to like give it to you. Okay. 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 Good, 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 good. Cool. Well, I don't know. I'm really tired. Me too. I had a great time though. Yeah. I really enjoyed the space with you and this conversation. Yeah, same. Yeah, it's nice to just like kind of have these. And I know a lot of people that listen to my podcast um, feel similarly about like animal agriculture Mm -hmm. and a lot of them are like activists. And um, I haven't had just such like an honest open conversation like about this I've tiptoed around it because I think like a lot of the people I have on like they do eat meat or dairy or something you know or like you know but they've I mean anyway so it's just it's just nice to have a conversation like this a big thing too uh last few comments when we when us as us as vegans like when we come across like these incidences where we are like backfired about what we preach for and when Mm -hmm. people flick at us or when people like cough at us or Just try to project any sort of, like, violence or negativity towards us. It's totally understandable. It's just the projection of immaturity. That's where they are. Um, But the best thing always is to always take care of yourself. Like, always find a way to decompress as vegans because our health is so important. Our inner space is so important. Our, Our positive... Our, our mind is so important. We really have to take care of our own spirit and nurture our own body and our mind um, in order for us to be powerful and empowered as, as positive changers in this world. So when we feel angsty or down or depleted from these incidences, it's always important to always take care of yourself. Give yourself space when you need to. And um, that's one of the best advice I could ever give you. There can be burned outs and never shame yourself for it, but always know how to take care of yourself first. Hell yeah. Woo. Thanks. <laughs> that was beautiful. Eat your vegetables. Go to bed early. <laughs> Drink water. Drink coconut juice. Wee. <laughs> um, <Ow. laughs> and on that note... <laughs>